physical objects are, are extremely much more complicated and much less understood. So, and in this sense, they are a lot more mysterious than, than the mathematical objects we deal with, which are perfectly uh, defined and determined and, and, and you know, uh, they are there and uh, they don't change. <laughs> Uh, we can study them uh, in a very precise manner. Um, we can prove theorems about them. So our, our knowledge of those objects is far better, uh, a lot better than the knowledge we have of, of physical objects. That's, and in this sense, and I agree with Joel, in this sense, their existence is more obvious than the existence of, of physical objects. It's more clear that, that they are something, that, that there is something there with very definite properties that we can understand perfectly well. Whereas for physical objects, um, who knows? Hello, my geeselings. This is Mother Goose, Robinson Earhart, here with Pins the Podcast and also the introduction to Robinson's Podcast, number 92. And this episode is with Juan Bagaria, who is ICREA Research Professor in the Department of Experimental Sciences and Mathematics at the University of Barcelona. So Juan is a mathematical logician who specializes in set theory. And set theory is one of, I guess, I, I think that the number shifts depending on who you ask, but it's one of the four branches of mathematical logic, including also model theory, recursion theory, and proof theory. And then maybe somebody else would add category theory or something else. But anyways, set theory is a branch of mathematics, mathematical logic known for a number of things. It's the branch that is dedicated to the investigation of infinity for one. Uh, it's of immense importance to philosophy and it also serves as the foundation for the rest of mathematics, though what this means and its implications are explored in the episode. But right off the bat, all you really need to know about set theory before we get into the details uh, in the episode is that it's really immensely powerful. And at least on some levels, it's also quite intuitive. A set is basically just a collection of objects uh, the identity of a set is determined by its members. So no two sets have the same members or they would otherwise be the same set. Uh, one set is the same size as another set or cardinality. Uh, it's of the same cardinality. That's the, the term we would use in set theory. If their members can be drawn into one-to-one -one -one correspondence with each other. And beyond the basic tools of logic, the only extra relation added, which is somewhat constitutive of what it means to be a set, is the membership relation. So we say that an object is a member of a set if it belongs to a set, uh, or of a particular set if it belongs to that particular set. So in this episode, uh, which I've titled, I think, uh, What is Set Theory? Uh, Joan and I discuss all things set theory, beginning with its origins, uh, in George or Jorg, uh, my my German doesn't tell me whether I should pronounce it Jorg or George, but George Cantor. Um, it's further development in the 20th century. Very important things happening at the turn of the the 19th to 20th century, and then some philosophical questions, mainly in metaphysics and epistemology. So, what is a set? How do we know about them? Are they, uh, quote unquote, real existing objects? And then we also talk about some current outstanding problems, uh, though they might not be considered outstanding to some. The chief one I have in mind is the, the continuum problem, which we'll get into. And then at the end of the episode, we also touch on Catalan independence, which is a topic very dear to Juan's heart in a in a previous episode, I think the episode with Joel David Hampkins and Graham Priest on logical and mathematical pluralism, I accidentally identified Juan as a Spaniard, which was inaccurate. And we talk all about this at the end of the episode. 
which is a bit more technical than I had intended, at least maybe in the first 10 minutes or so, and, and then again in the last 15 or so. And at some point, maybe I will do a a solo episode with just the real bare bones uh, basics. But anyway, it was still totally awesome to hear Juan's perspective on uh, towards the end, forcing uh, large cardinals and alternative axiomatizations of of set theory. But as far as background is concerned, Juan wrote the article on set theory in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, so you should check that out. I've linked it. And then his colleague in Spain, uh, Jose Ferreros, has an article on the early development of set theory, which I've also linked. And then you should te- check out or keep up with Juan on Twitter at Bagaria Juan. And also, as usual, I have to mention that reviews, likes, subscribes, these are greatly and endlessly, in fact, appreciated. So without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Juan. These conversations typically begin with my asking my guest how it was that they became interested in their subject matter. But for this episode, I think that that's particularly important since, as we discussed, I mean, this is this is meant to be an introduction to some of the topics in set theory, uh, the mathematics of it and the philosophy of it. I'm particularly curious about just what it was that you found so important about the subject that you wanted to devote your career to it, especially since set theory is, I mean, just as far from mainstream mathematics as it is from mainstream philosophy. Well, yes, um, right. Uh, I started out as a philosopher. I did my BA in philosophy in Barcelona uh, back in the late 70s. And uh, then eventually I, I decided I wanted to do mathematical logic. I I got a Fulbright scholarship to come to Berkeley to do a PhD. And my first intention was to do model theory, actually. I didn't know much set theory at the time. But then in Berkeley, I got some fantastic uh, courses in set theory, and I got really, really interested. Uh, I I guess what what really sparked my interest was um, learning about forcing. You know, forcing is a fantastic technique for building models of set theory, mathematical universes. And it's so incredibly beautiful and and it's all magic. So this really, you know, uh, got me really interested. And I said, well, I want to do this. Um, And uh, this, I I would say it's on a more uh, technical level. But um, philosophically, I also got interested in set theory because I, I... the way I, I saw set theory, and I still regard it, is um, um, as the theory of truth, the general theory of truth. That's how, if you ask me to define set theories, that's how I would define it. Um, I know this is very vague, and uh, I, <laughs> but that, that would be my, <laughs> my first take on it. it. Yeah, interesting. I'd never heard of it described as... A theory of truth before, but maybe we'll get into that in more depth when we talk about some of the philosophical aspects of set theory. But before okay. we get into some of those, unless you wanted to talk about it right now, unless you think it's well, relevant it's, at the uh, outset, yeah, whatever. Yeah, we, we can we can go back to this later. Okay, sure. So I think it would be nice before we get into some of the more technical and mathematical details to talk briefly about set theory's origins. So your colleague in Sevilla, Mm -hmm. Jose Ferreros, he's one of the authorities on the subject. And I'm going to point our listeners to his article in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy in the introduction, Mm -hmm. if they're interested. So we don't have to get into too much detail here, but maybe you could say a bit about who George Cantor, the inventor of set theory, was, and what some of the considerations were that went into the development of set theory. 
Right, yeah. Uh, Georg Cantor, uh, he was um, a mathematician. Uh, uh, he, he was born in St. Petersburg, but he was a uh, ger uh, German. Uh, he spoke like German. Um, and uh, he, he was uh, analyzing. Um, so his work was mostly in analysis. And uh, uh, he, his ideas about uh, sets, about what we call now set theory that, that he started developing, his ideas about infinite sets, infinite uh, numbers, infinite ordinals, and so on. All these started um, from, from analysis, okay? So he was um, one of his uh, initial results, uh, uh, Famous results was that uh, by look uh, analyzing uh, closed sets of the real line, right, and and uh, doing what is now called the Cantor derivative uh, process. So you start with a closed set of the real line, and this set may have isolated points. Uh, you throw them away, but now you have created new isolated points, and you keep going like this. You keep throwing away those isolated points and see what's left. And uh, he realized that this process may not terminate after you go even infinitely many steps, that you may go even further. So in order to analyze the sets of points in the real line, in the continuum, um, the, the analysis may go on for more than infinitely many steps, right? So he needed tax or or. Uh, to to um, to tag those steps even beyond infinity, right? And this is the origin of the transfinite transfinite ordinal numbers. This is how he he came up uh, with this idea, and and eventually he proved the theorem uh, by analyzing those closed sets, saying that uh, every closed set uh, is um, consists of countably many points that you have thrown away into countably many steps. Uh, and then there is a, what is called the perfect core, a perfect uh, a closed set that has no isolated points. And that was one of his um, uh, early results and, and a very important one. And this is the one that, that um, uh, got him the idea of, of uh, introducing those transfinite tags or ordinal, what we call now ordinal, transfinite ordinal numbers. Uh, then, um, well, then there are, of course, other fantastic theorems he proved. Then uh, perhaps the most uh, famous and, and most surprising to people who have never seen this was to show that the, the real line uh, cannot be count. The points of the real line cannot be counted. In other words, that no matter how you count using the counting numbers, one, two, three, four, and so on, no matter how you count the points on the real line, um, when even if you finish, even if you use all the counting numbers, there are infinitely many of those, but still there will be always points in the real line that you have not counted. Um, the, and this is, um, this is uh, quite shocking, right? Because the, the counting numbers mm -hmm. are, you have infinitely many of them, the points in the line, you have infinitely many of them, and yet, those two infinities are different. The, the infinity of the points in the real line is larger. It's a larger infinite. And then he proved that uh, this always happens. So the, given any, any um, set uh, collection of objects that is infinite, there's always another collection of objects, another set that is infinite, and it's bigger. So that, that cannot be... Um, Put into one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, with the other one. So the, he he discovered that there is this um, uh, hierarchy or series of infinities that go um, that grow bigger and bigger and bigger. They are all infinite, yes, but the, they have different sizes. Okay, that that was the the main discovery, I think, um, and. Um, well, then he developed the whole theory of, of card infinite uh, infinite cardinal numbers uh, to in order to um, uh, assign sizes or what the, the intuitive notion of size when we when we are talking about inf infinite uh, sets or uh, infinite collections of objects 
is the the notion of um, um, so two sets of objects, if, even if they are whether they are finite or infinite, they have the same size. If the if the two sets can be put into one to one correspondence with one another, and then we say those two sets have the same size, right? Um, okay. Uh, in the case of what what the theorem I mentioned, what it showed was that if you have the the natural numbers, the counting numbers on one side, and you have the points on the line on the other side, no matter how you uh, put them into one-to-one -one correspondence, uh, uh, you will never be able to uh, put all the real uh, all the points in the line into such a correspondence. There there will always be uh, points in the line that are left out. And uh, so we say, this is why he said, and we say that the, there are more points in the line than counting numbers, that the, the, the number that measures the size of the real line is bigger than the number that measures the size of the counting numbers. So these are two different infinite numbers. The first one, the, the, the size of the counting numbers, this is called Aleph zero. Um, he, Cantor called it Aleph zero. That's the first infinite cardinal number. And then there is the size of the, the, the real line, the, the continuum. Now, what is the number that corresponds to this? Well, it's not known. This is the famous continuous problem. Um, so the, the, continu the, the, the continuum problem, also known as the continuum hypothesis, is... Uh, is this is precisely what is the size? What is the cardinal, the infinite cardinal number that corresponds to the size of the continuum? And that's still not known. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a there's a great deal of of work um, that has been done on that. There are many results. Um, maybe I don't know if you want to want me to talk about this now or. Um, uh, no, I think I think we should get into that a little bit later after we talk okay. a bit about the development of axiomatic set theory. But for the moment, what was the the sort of reasoning that led Cantor to, to conclude that there are different cardinalities of infinite size that are incommensurable? Right. Uh, <clears throat> well, I mean... Um... He has he had the proof of that, right? So he, uh, Cantor proved uh, that uh, if you have, if you take uh, on the one hand uh, all the counting numbers, the natural numbers as they are known, um, zero, one, two, three, and so on, and on the other side you have the points in the line, uh, then there is no way you can establish a one-to-one -one correspondence. And the idea is very simple. I mean, I, I can I can explain it in in. In a few words. So take instead of taking the whole line, take just the, the interval between zero and one. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now suppose you could count all the numbers uh, strictly between zero and one. Well, any number there can be written in the form zero point and then decimals, right? The, right. Those decimals can be finitely many or can go forever. Doesn't matter. So imagine that you you have been able to count all the points between zero and one. So you have a list, right? So you have the first one in the list is zero point whatever. The second one in the list is zero point whatever and so on, right? So imagine you have this infinite list in which you have counted all the points between zero and one. Now you do what is called the diagonal argument. On this list, you draw the diagonal and then you write zero point and if in the first decimal of the first number you have say three then you write four if in the second decimal of the second number you have nine then you write three whatever so you write something different in the nth position to what you have in the nth position of the nth number in your list so you see you imagine the diagonal and you change all those numbers well, the number you have written now is zero point with some decimal, so it's between zero and one, but it was not in your list because it's different from the first, different from the second, different from the third, and so on and so forth. So here you have produced, actually in an effective manner, a new number that it's in the, in the interval zero, one, yet it was not 
in your list. So this shows that no matter how you list all the points between zero and one, there will always be numbers that are left out. And this is how he uh, realized that that the, the, the size of the interval zero one or, or the, the whole line is bigger in this sense, in the sense that they can, it cannot be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with the counting numbers. And he assigned um, uh, names to those sizes. So two sets have the same size if they can be put into one-to-one -one correspondence. So the natural numbers and the real line have different sizes. So different infinite numbers have to be assigned to them. And this is how, how he came... Uh, came up with this idea of, of, uh, of uh, tra what we call transfinite or infinite cardinal numbers and um, how um, uh, his set theory is uh, developed from that also together with his theory of ordinals and so on. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's the main idea, right? Mm -hmm. So Cantor was working in what we now call naive set theory, which is yes. quite different from current set theory. So this sort of sure. set theory you do, which is done axiomatically. And right. clearly naive set theory, uh, which is done with an intuitive notion of set and the set theoretic universe. So the concepts aren't fleshed out with axioms. It was very successful. I mean, you've just talked about some very important early results. Right. So before we move on to the axiomatic method, which is pretty much taken for granted today, can you say uh -huh. a bit more about how you think of what naive set theory is and how, I mean, despite the sorts of successes you were just talking about, it results in serious problems like Russell's paradox and other paradoxes that require um, the axiomatic method to prevent? Yeah, exactly. So, so what happened is that, um, as, as you said, um, uh, it's, I completely agree that, that at the beginning, Cantor was uh, working in a naive way, what we would now call naive set theory. Um, he was not working axiomatically, uh, but eventually, um, as the theory developed, uh, there were some so-called paradoxes coming up, uh, it was realized that um, uh, one had to be really careful not to run into contradictions or paradoxes, as, as sometimes are called. And this is what originated the, the need for um, giving set theory and mathematics in general uh, a firm base on which to be developed. Now, and this is why in current mathematics, uh, we always work axiomatically just to, so the axiomatically means that you spell out exactly what are your axioms or initial assumptions. And then um, uh, what is considered to be a theorem is uh, any statement that can be proved from those axioms using the usual rules of logic, right? So now in the, in the case of set theory, there appeared, uh, some paradoxes um, around the turn of the century. The most famous is Russell's paradox, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, Russell's paradox. Okay, so there's this uh, the 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 naive approach to set theory. Um, uh, uh, you know, re requires the assigning. Um, uh, so what is what 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 is a what is a set naively? I mean, a, a set is a is a, is a collection of objects that we regard it as a one, as a, a totality, right? Okay, so we talk about the set of uh, whales or the set of chairs or the set of whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Now, uh, this, is, this is a naive approach to sets. And uh, the problem with that is that um, we cannot assume that every property determines a set. For example, the property of being uh, uh, a whale or the property of being a, a chair or the property of being a number or the property of being a tree, whatever. So 
the, um, so, so even though we talk about, we can talk and we do talk about the set of all people, for example, or the set of all trees, um, doing this in general, uh, it's very dangerous because um, uh, you run into, for example, Russell's paradox. What is, uh, you have to, does, is the set of all sets a set? That, that's a question, right? Uh, so how about the property of not a set not being an element of itself? And that's what prompted uh, Russell's paradox, right? So if you, if you consider uh, uh, the set of all sets that are not members, that are not elements of themselves, then you run into paradox because if this is a set, then uh, if this property determines a set, then this set belongs to itself, even only if it does not belong to itself. And this is a contradiction. So, um, okay. So, and, and there are other contradictions, right? Like, for example, considering the, the, if, if the property of being an ordinal number, which is a property, determines a set, then, well, <laughs> this set itself is an ordinal number, but uh, the, so so uh, the set you started with did not contain all the ordinal numbers because here you have produced one that is not uh, that was not in the set. So you you run into all sorts of uh, either contradictions or difficulties or um, all sorts of pro logical problems that you want to avoid. Um, right. So uh, this this is why there was a need. For for a uh, for a firm base, a, a logically sound firm base on which to do uh, set theory uh, and also mathematics in general, right? And this is why uh, um, starting with um, Ernst Zermelo in in 1908, he produced the first axiomatization of set theory, which was still not not optimal, but anyway, it was the first attempt, and this was. Later, uh, shortly later, improved by several people, by Scholem, by Frankel, uh, making precise the notion of property um, that also used uh, um, to make precise the notion of property. Uh, in set theory, you, 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 you use uh, first order logic. And um, so with, this, with these improvements, um, um, we get what is now now known as Zermelo-Frankel set theory. That's the standard axiomatic system. It's very simple. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. It consists of, uh, well, it's an infinite list because you need one axiom for each property. But uh, essentially, uh, the axioms are extremely simple, um, intuitively true. Um, there's no discussion about those axioms. Then there is another axiom called the axiom of choice that this is more problematic. Um, and the axiom of choice, it's problematic because it has some uh, unintuitive consequences. Uh, yet it's used on a daily basis by most mathematicians. Uh, it was widely used before people identified it. So, so it shows that it was indeed a natural uh, axiom of mathematics or set theory in particular. Um, but again, uh, this is an axiom that, that it's almost universally accepted by, by everyone, but, uh, it's an axiom that, uh, has been, and still is to some extent a bit controversial because it has some, uh, counterintuitive, uh, consequences. Mm -hmm. So now, so and when we talk, uh, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, so to paraphrase and. To sum up, I mean, while naive set theory was quite successful in certain ways because certain concepts like property, for instance, weren't mm -hmm. rigorously fleshed out, it right. resulted in paradoxes that mm -hmm. really endangered not only set theory, but the foundations of mathematics. Because if you get exactly. a contradiction, you can essentially prove anything. So the axiomatic yeah. method was introduced to preclude the possibility of these uh, contradictions and to set out a, a framework maybe of 
properties or principles that everybody could agree on. Uh, ideally, you mentioned axioms like choice that were up for dispute, but that would characterize the universe of sets. Yeah, that's right. Well, I, I should say that, that uh, of course, um, we don't know for sure that the, the, the axiom system that we're, we are using, the zermelo frankel axioms plus the axiom of choice, is actually consistent. And we know by right. Biddle's incompleteness theorems that we cannot prove it is consistent by using only those axioms. Yet there is, a, I mean, there is, a, a, I would say, a universal... Uh, agreement that, or almost universal agreement that they are consistent, and uh, um, so we we because we believe that. Wh why do we believe they are consistent? Well, because we believe they are true, right? True about sets, um, even though we cannot prove this with within the system. But that's that's uh, something that is unavoidable because of Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Sure. And as you mentioned, uh, there are, I mean, ZFC is the the standard set theory that is most common today, but there are other set theories. So uh, Ernst Zermelo's axiomatization is just known as Z, for instance, or ZF right. is yeah. Zermelo Frankel without choice. There, there are plenty of others, new foundations. But right. since Zermelo Frankel is the dominant set theory, I think that's the one that we should spend most of our time talking about. And I also think it would be very useful, especially for somebody who hasn't thought or heard much about set theory before, to go through some of the axioms and okay. to think about what they say about the universe of sets. So the first one, maybe the most obvious that comes to mind, is the axiom of extensionality. So what is the axiom of, ex of extensionality and what does it purport to tell us or claim about the universe of sets or the concept of set, if you prefer talking about it that way? Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, extensionality is is a um, uh, totally obvious axiom about sets. It's kind of definitional axiom because it just says that two sets are equal if and only if they have the same elements. So that's that's uh, so it's a kind of definitional axiom. It tells us what a set is. A set is something that is completely characterized by its elements, nothing else, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so they're the identity uh, conditions of a set, right? Right. Yeah. So they are equal if and only if they have the same they have the same elements. Uh, that's that defines essentially what a set is, right? And then mm -hmm. uh, there are other simple axioms, like, for example, the, the, the axiom of pairs, that it says that if you have two sets, A and B, then there is a set that is formed by those two sets as elements. So there is a set that contains those two sets as, it, as its only elements. So you can form pairs of sets, okay? And if you can form pairs of sets, then you can form bigger sets, right? Because then you can take A and B plus the pair, uh, and so on. So you can build up from those and, and generate uh, lots of uh, very simple sets. Then uh, there's the axiom of union, which says that if you have a set of sets, then you can put them all together, right? So you can uh, produce a set that its elements are the elements of the elements of each one of the sets you started with. So you just just put take the union of all the sets you started with, and this is this is a new set called the union, um, and the axiom tells you that this set exists. Um, a more important um, axiom is the axiom of power set. That's the notion of subset. So you have a, any set, we can look at subsets of this set. What is a subset? Well, it's another set. Uh, formed by elements of the original set, right? So it's a subset of it. Okay, so the axiom of power set, what it tells you is that uh, given any set, say A, uh, the power set of A exists. What is the power set? Is the set that contains all subsets of A. Mm -hmm. So given any set, there is another set consisting of all subsets of it. 
And that, that's mm -hmm. a power set axiom. And this is extremely powerful, but it's also very right. mysterious because it tells right. you that this set exists, but it never tells you what subsets exist. So we know that there exists a set containing all subsets, but which subsets exist? I mean, of course, there are there. Are, um, um, there is another axiom called the, the separation axiom, which says that given any set and given any property, you can form uh, the set of all elements in the set that have the property, right? So you can, by using a, a given any property and given any set, you can separate uh, the elements of the set that have this property and this forms a new set. That's the axiom of separation. So this axiom tells us how to form subsets of a given set. But are these all subsets there are? Mm -hmm. Well, you can, you can, you can prove that, that, uh, that uh, this is not the case. Yes, actually, this is not true in general. So, um, uh, okay. Um, then the, the, another very important axiom is the axiom of infinity that says that there is an infinite set, okay? In particular, you can formulate this in different ways, but usually it is formulated in the way of saying uh, essentially that the set of counting numbers exists. Um, this is essential to set theory. Without, without the axiom of infinity, uh, and if you take the th uh, zermelo frankel set theory and uh, you take away the axiom of infinity and add an axiom that says there are no infinite sets or that every set is finite, the theory you get is essentially arithmetic. It's the theory of, of uh, the natural numbers. So, and this is, this is actually, uh, the, so if you take the, the, the elementary theory of the natural numbers, uh, piano, what is called piano arithmetic, and you take finite set theory, so set theory, uh, minus you remove the infinity axiom and you add an axiom saying that there are no infinite sets, then those two theories can be interpreted one into the other in both ways. So it's essentially the same, right? So the, the axiom of infinity is what makes set theory set theory. So the, the theory of infinite sets. Okay, and then there is uh, there are a few more axioms. There, there is the so-called axiom of replacement. This was in, this was not in the original axiomatization by Zermelo. This was introduced later on by Frankel. This is why we call the theory Zermelo Frankel. And this axiom is saying something pretty obvious. Uh, it says that if you have uh, some set and you can define a function with domain D set. Right, so you have uh, you assign to every element in the set something, uh, and you can you have a definition of this. For example, I don't know. Take take the set of all people and take the function that assigns to each person its age. Right. So this is a I'm define I'm defining a function on the set of all people. Right. All right. So what the uh, and and you can do this. Uh, for any set and for any definable property, right? Uh, assigning, I don't know, uh, to each planet its diameter or assigning to to each uh, tree each its height or whatever. I mean, uh, you have a set of, of objects and you have some uh, way of assigning to each one of them certain other mm, something, whatever. Okay, so... Uh, in set theory, uh, the axiom of replacement says, uh, in a general way, that if you have any set and you have any way, uh, definable way of assigning something to each uh, to each element of your set, then uh, the collection of all those assignments form a set. So the range of the function is also a set. And this axiom is very important for set theory. Very, very important uh, because you need you need this axiom to do what are called um, recursive definitions into the into the transfinite into the infinite. You need this axiom for the development of the whole theory of of uh, infinite cardinals and so on. So it's essential to set theory. However, outside set theory is uh, almost. Uh, 
never used. So it's an axiom that that most mathematicians can can ignore uh, in their in their usual work. But however, within set theory, it's it's absolutely essential. Okay, so I think we are almost done. Yeah, there is another axiom. Uh, Finally, that's called the axiom of foundation. And uh, this axiom, um, what it tells you is that there are no pathological sets. Um, and I will explain what this means. Mm -hmm. So uh, the way to look at, at the axioms of, the, the right way to look at the axioms of Zermelo Frankel is to, um, uh, to view the universe of all sets, um, as what is called the von Neumann universe, right? So uh, in set theory, uh, we study only sets. So we, uh, so we study sets, sets of sets, sets of sets of sets, and so on and so forth. So wh where do we start? Well, we start with the empty set. The, there's no simple, uh, there's no set that is simpler than the empty set. So we start with the empty set. Then we take um, sets, uh, subsets of the empty set, subsets of subsets of the empty set, and so on, right? So, so we, uh, we, we carry out this process of starting from the empty set. Then the next step, we take all subsets of the empty set. This set is now is not empty because it contains at least one element, namely the empty set itself. Then we do this again. We take all subsets of this. And, and now we have two elements, right? We have the empty set and it's a set that with two elements, namely the empty set and the set that contains as its element, the empty set and, and keep going like this. So this grows exponentially. And for how long do we go? Well, we go for as long as possible, meaning that uh, if we, in the, we are indexing this process by the ordinal numbers going to the transfinite, so we go for infinitely many uh, steps and beyond that, then we continue. We continue as far as we can. And at each step, we take all the subsets of everything we have so far. So at each step, we take the power set, which for which we have an axiom that tells us that this exists. So we take the power set of what we have, then we take the power set again, the power set again, the power set. When we reach a limit, so when we go for infinitely many uh, uh, steps, what do we do? Well, uh, we take the union of all this. We have an axiom that tells us that this union exists. And we keep going. Then we take the power set again, the power set again, and so so we. Uh, this what is known the the jo uh, John von Neumann's uh, set theoretic universe, and that's the the way set theorists look at uh, the set theoretic universe. And if you look at it this way, then the Zermelo Frankel axioms are very very natural because they are exactly what you need to build such a universe. Yeah. So this motivates. Um, uh, a posteriori, the, the the introduction of those axioms. So it seems that that Zermelo Frankel is the right theory for the set theoretic universe, and that's the theory that that we use. Uh, that's the standard uh, theory. Uh, and then there's the axiom of choice, of course, that you don't need it to build the universe. But um, if you if you accept the axiom of choice, then you look at this universe, and the the axiom of choice is true there, so it's okay, you know. Mm -hmm. So that that's that's the the framework that we work with. That that's uh, the universe of sets as we see it, as it's described somehow by the by the axioms of Zermelo Frankel. Plus, plus choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you actually missed one axiom that's very important, I think. Uh, and it might be because I introduced Which one extensionality as the most well, basic yeah. axiom, but uh, it's right, right. the yeah. axiom yeah. of, yeah. of right. null Yeah, as I said at the, the beginning, axiom. extensionality is just a definitional axiom. I mean, uh, it just tells you what the set is. So Right. I was saying that the the one that you missed was the axiom of the empty set. Uh, well, yeah, you can do that, but it's not necessary to put it as an axiom because uh, okay, so formally uh, we work uh, this 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 axiom system, this collection of axioms, uh, 
can be formalized using first order logic, just one, with only one non-logical symbol, namely the symbol epsilon, which means it's an element. So a, a epsilon B means A is an element of B, right? Um, now, if you work in first order logic, um, you uh, with identity. So again, there, we, we work in a, in a formal language in which we also have identity. Um, and then uh, it is usually assumed that the, the, ax there, the axiom that says that something exists, it's a logical axiom. Right. So if you are, if we are in a set theoretic contest, uh, we don't need to introduce the axiom that the empty set exists because we have the logical axiom that says something exists, namely something means some set exists. But then if some set exists by using separation, you can produce the empty set. How? Well, take any set and now consider the property of not being uh, being different than itself. The property X is different than X. Well, what are the elements of the set that satisfy this property? None, of course, because everything is equal to itself. So by separation, I have separated from the set, the set of all objects that satisfy this property, but there is no such object. So I have created the empty set now. Mm -hmm. So you see, uh, I mean, uh, if you, yeah. you 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 can add the axiom saying there is the empty set, but it's not necessary. You can produce the empty set just from the other axioms and the logical axiom that says something exists. Sure. It is still uh, usually listed as one of the axioms of ZFC. And I think it's particularly important because along with the axiom of infinity, it provides a, a good segue uh -huh. for us to make a quick digression into some metaphysical and epistemological questions. Because okay. the, the axiom of the empty set quite literally asserts the existence of a set uh, that has no members. And the axiom of infinity quite literally asserts that there is an infinite, an infinite set. And... Uh -huh. I'm guessing that you would describe yourself as a mathematical Platonist, and that you believe that there yeah. exist, in some sense, these mathematical objects. And I'm just curious yes. how you would how you would explain what you take to be your justification for believing that there are these sets which are clearly so important if they're to form our foundation of mathematics when you also presumably cannot see them touch them uh hear right. them this sort of thing right yes uh okay yeah uh yeah um sets and in general all mathematical objects are of course abstract objects they don't exist physically um However, they, they, they do exist uh, as abstract objects. Uh, and the way I see the universe of all sets as existing is not different, uh, not very different from the way uh, we see the, the counting numbers existing. I mean, um, the, the, let's start with this. So let's start with the counting numbers, zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. Okay. Those are, um, those, I don't think anyone would deny that that uh, numbers, natural counting numbers, or at least up to the numbers that people have ever counted uh, to, right, which are only finitely many, that those numbers exist in a, in some way, right? It's not something, it's not something uh, invented. It's something that that uh, is part of the world. I mean. Um, the, on, on this table in front of me, there are five books, right? Not four, not three. Uh, being five is something that I'm not making up. It's, a, it's some property of those objects on this table, right? There are five, not, not, not six, not seven, and so on. So uh, the counting numbers do have um, a reality, do have an existence that I think uh, most people, I think most people would agree on that. Um, but now, uh, when one looks at uh, the natural numbers and, and uh, 
and starts studying them, uh, one realizes that, um, of course, that there is no last natural number. They go on and on forever. So this this uh, this is an infinite set. If you, you well, I mean, people, some people uh, wouldn't wouldn't call this a set or just a, a, a potential set, right? There's, uh, I think, we should not go into the long debate between. Um, potential and actual infinity, but, um, uh, okay. But anyway, so, uh, th there are, there are infinitely many natural numbers and those natural numbers have, uh, very, uh, specific properties that, uh, we can study. Those are the, what we call arithmetical properties. We have basic operations on them. We have the sum, the product and so on. They, they are ordered in a, in a, in a certain way. Okay, so this is uh, a mathematical structure that is uh, very well understood and, and uh, you don't have to be an expert mathematician to, to understand the basic properties of it. Now, with set theory, things become a bit more complicated, but they are not essentially different. I mean, in set theory, we have this, again, this uh, very, um, basic notion of set and I, I actually I would say uh, you cannot think of a more basic notion than the notion of set if you try to explain what a set is it's impossible you have to uh, you you go in circles uh, even Cantor when he first tried to define what a set is uh, he, he says that the set is a collection well then what is a collection I mean so you there's no way uh, I, I, I mean I've never I've never seen any definition of set that doesn't somehow uh, include uh, its, its, uh, itself, right? That is not circular. Um, so the notion of set is so basic, is so simple that, that um, I cannot think of a simpler notion than that. So, but if you start with this basic notion of set and then um, you look at the, 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 these basic operations with sets of taking subsets, of taking unions, of taking pairs, and so on. Then uh, the, what you come up eventually is with this uh, view of sets that form uh, the, the von Neumann universe. And, this, uh, and the way it's, it's, um, it's uh, defined or, or constructed, uh, as, as I explained before, that you start with the empty set and keep taking the power set at each step. When you reach a limit, you take the union and so on. So this is a very well defined, very well described uh, mathematical structure um, that you want to study, that you want to see um, what properties it has, uh, how far does it go, how how big is it, uh, how complex is it, and so on. And then you have this theory, Zermelo Frankel, that uh, describes this structure to a certain extent. And that's what set theories do. They use this theory to, to study the properties of this universe, set theoretic universe. And we know that this theory is insufficient, that there are many questions, some very simple questions that this theory does not answer. And so this prompts the introduction of new axioms for this and, and so on and so forth. So this has, uh, um, to me, and, and I would say to most people who work on this, this structure, this mathematical structure does have a reality. It's not something that that is arbitrary or invented. No, it, it has a, a reality in the same sense that the natural numbers have a reality. And that, that it, in the sense that, so it's, it's part of the, of the universe out there. Uh, so I, I don't see, I don't see um, much difference between, between the, the natural numbers uh, and, and the set theoretic universe, uh, essentially. Mm -hmm. What you've said reminds me a great deal of something, uh, Joel David Hampkins, said, uh -huh. I think both of the times he's been on the podcast in that he finds the existence of the empty set to be much more obvious than yeah. or much more clear 
than the existence of like the cup he was holding at the time. Right. And right. what it sounds like to me is that you're saying you have far more ready and available insight and access to the properties of sets and the universe of sets right. than you do to like the existence of this phone. Like the physics of this is very, very mysterious. You, you're not certain of any and, properties and it's, it's, of it really. Right. Quantum mechanics. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah it's a, uh, I mean, physical so, objects are, are extremely m much more complicated and much less understood. So, and in this sense, they are a lot more mysterious. Than, than the mathematical objects we deal with, which are perfectly uh, defined and determined and, and, and you know, uh, they are there and uh, they don't change. <laughs> uh, we can study them uh, in a very precise manner. Um, we can prove theorems about them. So our, our knowledge of those objects is far better a lot better than the knowledge we have of, of physical objects. That's, and in this sense, and I agree with Joel, in this sense, their existence is more obvious than the existence of, of physical objects. It's more clear that, that they are something, that, that there is something there with very definite properties that we can understand perfectly well. Whereas for physical objects, um, who knows? Mm -hmm. And something else that I think Joel and others have said, and maybe you've alluded to as well, is that there's a certain richness and utility to the set theoretic framework, though imperfect, uh, that ZFC comprises mm -hmm. that makes you believe in it the, the the fruitfulness of it it couldn't have been this fruitful couldn't be the foundation for all of mathematics if there weren't some deep um, truth to it if it did not exist right. in, in an right. abstract way yeah yeah okay that's, so that's uh, also you'd say that's also accurate right right I, I agree with you yeah yeah I would say I would say this yes mm -hmm. It gives a it gives additional okay, great. the fact that it's so fruitful it gives additional uh, support to um, well to to not only to it being true uh, but also to being the right the right uh, theory of sets yes mm -hmm. okay then the last thing I'd like to get back to while we're on this little digression about maybe metaphysics and epistemology is why you you mentioned earlier that you think of set theory as the, the general theory of truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> well, I mean, um, it's uh, this this has been said before and, and uh, not maybe not for set theory, but certainly for mathematics. I mean, uh, um, uh, I was in a in a talk not so long ago by Martin Brightson, a very famous British mathematician, and he defined mathematics as a vast exploration of truth, and and uh, I entirely agree with that. Uh, and set theory, insofar it's the foundation of mathematics, so it 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 gives you the the it's it's the foundation it's the basis of mathematics and therefore if you view mathematics as an exploration of truth then set theory is um is the foundation for that so the the it's i i think that set theory is um uh i would say i'm a, I'm a logicist to a certain extent uh, probably to a full extent i i believe set theory is part of logic and it's part of the and, and logic uh, seen as, as the the uh, part of um, the, as the theory of of investigating truth and how how truth uh, what is true and and how um, truth is preserved through reasoning and so on. So set theory is is also part of that, and and um, so I, I I'm interested. Uh, in contrast with Joel, for example, I think, and let me be a bit polemic here. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I, I think that, that the goal of set theory is to study the set theoretic universe, which I think it has a, a precise uh, 
it's 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 a very well determined uh, abstract entity or, or mathematical entity, and and our goal is to study this universe in where in this universe is where all happens. All I mean, all mathematical happens there, right? Now, um, Joel has a more playful approach to set theory, what I, I would call a playful approach because he, he likes to investigate all sorts of different models of different um, theories of sets and so on. And, and um, he, um, he, he plays with them and he proves great theorems about them. I mean, uh, he's, uh, he has a fantastic uh, work in set theory as a, as we all know, uh, but but his view of sets is very different from mine because I, I I see all he does as being as happening inside this uh, inside V the the true universe of sets where everything happens right so um, if you want when I say that set theory is uh, the theory of truth is because. If if you if if you make any statement in mathematics, not only in set theory but in, in mathematics, and you want to know if it's true or not, well, how do you know? Well, you have to uh, you have to prove it. And what does it mean to prove it? It means you prove it from some axioms using logic. And how do you know those axioms are true? Well, uh, ultimately, ultimately the the test for ex what tells you the theory that tells you what exists and what is true. Is that theory? You that that's that's the bottom of it, right? I mean, uh, you what well, if you do uh, whatever uh, if you work in any area of mathematics, you work with topological spaces or algebraic structures. How do you know those exist? Well, you go to set theory. In set theory, you can build. Or you can show that those structures, or at least something isomorphic to them, does exist. You prove it. You prove that those objects exist. Uh, and then just by using the axioms of set theory, uh, you, can, you can prove theorems about them. Yes. And that's how mathematics works. And this is how mathematical truth is warranted. You, you can only say that something is true in mathematics if th this can be done, at least in principle. I mean, usually it's not done. Usually mathematics work in their, in their own fields, using their own, um, their own uh, local axioms or ideas and so on. But uh, this, this uh, grounding is, uh, can be done in principle. So if someone has doubts about the truth of some mathematical statement, well, you have to analyze the proofs, see what objects are required to exist for this to work, see if all the reasoning is correct. And uh, ultimately, you can, uh, if, if one has enough patience or enough will to do that, one could, in principle, formalize all this into the language of set theory and then check in set theory that this is indeed true. So ultimately, Mathematical truth uh, uh, is based on set theoretic truth, and this is why I'm saying that is the set theory is ultimately the the, the theory of truth. Mm -hmm. That's um, very helpful. I think it would be a good idea for a moment to, because we we've been talking a lot, I think quite broadly about set theory as the foundations for mathematics, but maybe to give some concrete examples for uh, our listeners about mm -hmm. why we think of set theory as the foundations of mathematics, for instance. So like, what does it mean or how does one represent the, the counting, the natural numbers in right. um, set theory? And, maybe show how that can be extended to the integers and the rationals, like this sort of thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> right. So let me try. Um, okay. So we have um, the counting numbers. Let's start with 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth. So now what are those numbers? Well, who knows? But uh, we can represent those numbers set theoretically. How? Well, uh, we represent zero by the empty set. One is we represent it by a set with one element, namely the empty set. 
two with a set of two elements, namely the set that contains as elements zero and one, and three as the set that contains as elements zero, one, and two, and so on and so forth. So set theoretically, the number n is the set of all the numbers less than n. Okay, the, I agree. I mean, I, I will not go into the discussion uh, of whether the numbers really are those sets. Well, probably not, or whatever they are metaphysically, who knows. But uh, the fact is that we can represent the natural numbers set as sets. And uh, we can um, define the, the usual operations on natural numbers like sum and product as operations on sets. And then mm -hmm. we can we can show that the the this representation as sets of the natural numbers with their set theoretic operations that represent the arithmetical operations, this satisfies all the properties that uh, we usually have about uh, those operations, like being uh, you know commutative and distributive and so on. All those arithmetical operations. All these properties um, can be shown uh, that 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 they hold for the set theoretic representation. So, for all, the, what does it mean? It means that for all practical purposes, we may assume that the natural numbers with their usual operations are in fact those sets with those operations, and that's very useful because when you try to solve some hard problem and you need to go to maybe uh, you are assuming, well, when you do higher math, especially when you, you need to assume the existence of really complicated structures or really complicated uh, spaces or whatever, well, um, uh, you, you need to have some, some uh, basic theory that tells you that those objects, those properties, you are okay with that, then you may assume that such things exist and have those properties. And how do you guarantee this? Well, by going to set theory. That, that's a theory that guarantees that those sets exist, that those objects exist, the, the properties uh, uh, you are studying um, make sense or, you know, um, and, and this process that you can do with the natural numbers of viewing them as set theoretic entities, you can extend it to all mathematical entities. So from the natural numbers, you can build set theoretically the, the, the integers as equivalence classes um, of pairs of natural numbers. Then you can, from the integers, you can build the rationals as equivalence classes of pairs of integers. Then you can build the real numbers as Dedekind cuts uh, of the rationals and so on. And so you progress from, from pure sets to uh, natural numbers, the integers, the rationals, the reals, the complex numbers, and more complicated uh, and uh, mathematical structures, any you know, uh, groups and fields and rings and uh, topological spaces of all sorts and geometrical objects. And if you go to higher math, uh, you, you uh, categories and, and whatever. I mean, everything can ultimately be um, represented set theoretically. And, and this is why set theory, we call it the foundation of mathematics because ultimately anything you do mathematically, you can translate it or you can represent it within the framework of set theory. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how it works. So again, uh, just, I guess, to, to paraphrase or sum up some of the last few things you said, modulo the, the consistency of ZFC. So assuming ZFC is consistent, though we, we can't prove this uh, mm -hmm. because of Gödel's results, take the theory of arithmetic, so the theory of the natural numbers. We yes. can represent the natural numbers in set theory, as yes. you explained, beginning with um, the right. empty set, and then mm -hmm. prove everything that we would like to about the natural numbers within set theory. And this yes. sort of process can be iterated and expanded upon yeah. to yeah, and, and including the, the numbers. Including the consistency. So in set theory, you can prove that arithmetic is consistent, whereas you cannot do this within arithmetic. So, uh, and so on, right. Okay, great. and. 
Now I think it would be a nice idea to turn back to some of the questions about infinity that were raised earlier when we were talking about naive set theory. And right. you mentioned the the this the hierarchy of infinities yeah. and you might have even referred to the continuum hypothesis and the continuum problem. Mm -hmm. But can you explain again maybe the thought and process that went into the formulation explicitly? of the continuum hypothesis? And maybe now that we've talked about the Platonist view of the universe of sets, how these things relate and why the continuum problem is such a natural problem for somebody who views the universe of sets as a real bona fide existing, although abstract object. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, yeah. Um... I explained at the beginning the, this theorem of Cantor showing that the infinite that in the real line there are more points uh, than uh, the, the, the points cannot be counted. So um, uh, the infinity of the of the size of the real line is a, is an infinity that is larger than the size of the counting number. So so a natural question is okay, uh, take any any set of points in the line. If it's infinite, okay, uh, well, it may happen then this set of points you have taken is countable. For example, if you take only the rational numbers, uh, then this is countable. They can, the rational numbers can be counted. Uh, if you take the algebraic numbers, for example, uh, those algebraic numbers can also be counted. That was also proved by Cantor. However, if you take the irrationals, the set of all irrational numbers, then this set cannot be counted. It has the same size as the whole real line. So natural question is, okay, if you, if you give me any set of points in the line and it's infinite, can I always guarantee that it will either be countable or it will have the same size as the whole real line? Can you guarantee this? Well, uh, if the answer yes is the is the continuum hypothesis. So the continuum hypothesis says that sets of real numbers that are infinite come only in two sizes, either the size of the counting numbers or the size of the whole line. That's it. There's no intermediate and, infinity there, right? That's the continuum hypothesis. Right. Now, uh, yeah, you were saying. Oh, I was just going to I was just going to give that second paraphrase. It's saying that there is the size of the natural numbers and then there's the size of the real numbers and there the question is whether or not there is an intermediate cardinality between right. them. And it's a right. natural question uh for yes. somebody who believes in the universe of sets that there is a fact of the matter here. Mhm. Mm Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, and the, the nice thing about the continuum hypothesis is that uh, uh, you, you don't need to develop the theory of uh, infinite cardinals or anything. It's just a, a, basic, a basic natural question about the continuum. So if we look at the real line as a representation of a linear continuum, Yes, so um, we know by Cantor's theorem that this continuum is um, has infinitely. It's it's an infinite entity. Uh, it's a if we view it as a collection of points, as a set of points, it's infinite. We know it's bigger than the counting numbers. Uh, this is a very natural question uh, that that would occur to. Uh, you don't have to be a, a well trained mathematician to ask this kind of question. Well. What, what are the sets? What, what are the sets of points? Uh, uh, if they are infinite, what, what can, can you compare them? Can, uh, which, one are, which ones are bigger or smaller? Are there any sets of points that, that can neither be counted nor, and yet, yet they are still smaller than the whole line? So this is, a, I think, a, an extremely basic question about the continuum that should be answered. And, um, well... What we know now is that uh, it's uh, it's independent of the axioms of Zermelo Frankel with choice. So uh, this means uh, that you can neither prove it nor disprove it. Uh, Kurt Gödel in 1938 
Um, he showed that uh, you cannot disprove it because there is a there is a universe of set theory that satisfies uh, all the axioms and in which the continuum hypothesis is true. This is called the Gödel's constructible universe. And then 25 years later, in 1963, Paul Cohen uh, produced another model of set theory, a universe of set theory in which all the ZFC axioms are true and in which the continuum hypothesis is false. And this means that uh, the axioms of ZFC are not strong enough to answer the question. It means that uh, with those axioms, you can neither prove the continuum hypothesis is true, you can, and you cannot prove either that, that it's false. So, uh, well, I mean, if you, if you are a formalist, then, uh, well, you can adopt the attitude saying, okay, then it's neither true nor false. You know, there are universes where it is true, universes where it is false. So it's okay. I mean, we study all those universes. We'll have different properties and so on. But if you if you have a view of set theory uh, like most set theorists, and including myself, that we what we are studying is the true universe of sets, then the continuum hypothesis must have an answer. It has to be either true or false in this universe, and that's what we want to know. So the fact that it's the continuum hypothesis is independent of ZFC only means that. Um, this theory is not a strong, strong enough to answer the question. So we need a stronger theory. We need to supplement ZFC with additional axioms that uh, will answer it. And that's another problem. Mm -hmm. And that is what I wanted to get to next. So if you want to settle the continuum problem, and you want to supplement ZFC with more axioms. I mean, I know that this leads into the search for uh, large cardinal axioms, but could I know that this, this is going to necessitate getting a bit more technical now, but yeah, maybe. What, what is the reasoning behind the search for these large cardinal axioms and why is it believed by, by some that it will help settle the continuum problem. Okay, um, <clears throat> right. So um, there are these um, there are these axioms known as large cardinal axioms that they assert that uh, some very very large uh, infinite cardinal numbers exist. Uh, large in the sense that they have some very uh, special properties. I, I will try to explain this a bit. So we have those axioms, okay? The, are, they have many different formulations. There are many sorts of them, but they, they do line up. Uh, those cardinals that we call large cardinals, they, they form a hierarchy of increasing strength. Yeah? The first ones are called inaccessible, and then there are so-called measurable and super compact and so on. There's a whole hierarchy, very rich hierarchy of those cardinals that uh, their existence cannot be proved in ZFC. So in ZFC, we cannot prove that those cardinals exist, yet uh, why, why, how, how did these cardinals come up? Where, where do they come from or what these notions of large cardinals uh, came about well uh, in a, in in many different ways. So the fact is that starting in the 1930s, uh, the notion of, for example, uh, inaccessible cardinal. So an inaccessible cardinal is is an infinite cardinal number that um, cannot be reached from below in less than that cardinal many steps, right? So it's something like the first infinite cardinal. Uh, which is called Aleph zero, you cannot reach Aleph zero in less than Aleph zero many steps because less than Aleph zero means only finitely many steps. If you go only finitely many steps, you will never get to it. So an inaccessible right. cardinal is something similar. So it's something uh, that is bigger than Aleph zero, yet you cannot reach it in less than that many steps. But not only that, uh, 
this uh, it has another property, and the property is that um, if you take any smaller cardinal and you look at uh, the cardinality of the set of all its subsets, which we know it's bigger by Cantor's theorem, you still cannot reach it. So in other words, uh, it's called inaccessible because you cannot reach it from below in less than many steps. And not only that, but you can not reach it from below by applying the power set operation to, to smaller cardinals. So even though by applying the power set operation, you increase the size, but doesn't matter. Uh, if you do that, you will never get to it, right? So that's called an inaccessible cardinal. And you can show that inaccessible cardinals cannot be proved to exist in ZFC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, their existence, uh, if, you, if you believe they should exist, uh, their existence has to be postulated as an additional axiom. And this is what is called a large cardinal axiom. Now, there are many more notions of large cardinals. Those are the smallest ones, but there are many more uh, that are larger and larger. And there's a whole hierarchy, an extremely rich theory of those cardinals. Very beautiful, very interesting. And uh, OK, but now these kind of axioms that postulate the existence of those cardinals, unfortunately, don't answer the continuum problem. So um, why? Well, because suppose those uh, large cardinal exist, then you can, by using this uh, forcing technique that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, you can expand the universe and uh, change the, the size of the continuum, uh, make it as big as you like, and yet uh, preserve that those cardinals still exist. So those cardinals really have no direct effect on the size of the continuum, on the cardinality of the continuum. So they don't answer uh, the continuum problem. However, one of, the, one of the greatest results in the last decades in set theory was a theorem of uh, uh, Martin and Steele and then Woodin, who showed that um, if there are those large cardinals, something called uh, infinitely many Woodin cardinals or super compact cardinals, then what they showed is that uh, there can be no definable counterexample to the continuum hypothesis. Namely, that uh, the, the, remember the continuum hypothesis says that there is no set of uh, points, no set of real numbers that has an intermediate size between the countable and the size of the real line. So what they showed is that um, there may be such a set, but there cannot be one that is easily definable. So maybe there is a there is such a set, but there's no way we can we can define it in any reasonable uh, manner, right? Which is great. I mean, so large cardinals do tell you the existence of these really enormous, uh, really huge cardinals. Uh, do they tell you uh, a lot? about the real numbers, which is something that is very basic, right? And this is something I find extremely uh, amazing, right? Because how could that be? I mean, how could those cardinals that live so far away into right. the transfinite have such a strong effect on some very basic properties of the continuum? And But that's a fact, that, that's what's happening. Now, there are other axioms that are called forcing axioms um, that they do solve the continuum problem. Um, for example, there is, there is an axiom called the proper forcing axiom that implies uh, that the continuum is, um, that is Aleph 2, which is the, the third uh, infinite cardinal. What, what this is saying is that um, if you look at sizes of sets of real numbers, they they can they they can only have three sizes. Either they are countable, or they have the same size as the whole real line, or there is one intermediate size, only one, right? So it's either Aleph zero, Aleph one, or Aleph two. No other sizes are possible. And these these axioms, like the proper forcing axiom, and in general all strong, so-called strong forcing axioms, they all imply that the continuum is Aleph 2. 
So if you believe those axioms, then uh, yes, then uh, the, continuum hypo the continuum problem has been solved and the size of the continuum is LF2. Now, are, are these axioms natural? Uh, are they really axioms? Should you believe in them? Well, um, here is something, um, uh, here's a theorem that I proved in, in 1997, 1999. Uh, okay, what I showed is that um, there are the so-called, something called the bounded forcing axioms. The most famous is Martin's axiom. It's a well-known axiom in mathematics, has many uses and so on. But not only Martin's axiom, but other uh, stronger forcing axioms like the bounded proper forcing axiom and so on. What, what, what I showed is that they are equivalent. You can prove they are equivalent to the following. They say that if some set might exist in some forcing extension of the mathematical universe, and this, the properties of this set only depend on um, small things, I, I will not go into more technical details. If this set could possibly exist in one of those extensions of the universe, then it, it already exists. That, that's That's what... Uh, the axiom is saying. So those axioms are kind of uh, uh, axioms that maximize the set theoretic universe. If, if some object could possibly exist in some extension of the universe, you have to put some restrictions on that, otherwise it's inconsistent. But uh, modulo some technical requirements, uh, it's saying this, if something could possibly exist uh, in one of those extensions, then it already exists in the universe. And if you assume this as an axiom, then the continuum is LF2. Then the, the, the continuum problem has been settled. I don't know if this is now, convincing enough. No, 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 that was a, no that, I think that you did a, a wonderful job explaining some very difficult technical concepts. Now, the question, though, that comes to mind to me now is that Axioms like the empty set or pair or extensionality are extremely intuitive and mm -hmm. natural. But you raised right. the question of whether or not we should take these forcing axioms, for instance, yeah. as natural or whether or not we should believe them. And clearly they have some great utility in that they yeah. might settle the continuum hypothesis. Right. But what other grounds on which would you take them to be uh, natural or would you want to believe them? Do, do you believe well, them? Well, uh, okay. Um, I, I believe that once you reformulate in particular those uh, bounded forcing axioms in this way, in, in this maxim as these maximizing principles, then they become rather natural. I don't know if this is true. Okay. I wouldn't, I would, I wouldn't, affirm categorically that those are true axioms, maybe not, but they are, they are uh, I think, natural and, and, and also they have uh, lots of interesting consequences. There are whole books about consequences of Martin's axiom in, in many different areas. Uh, it has, they have been extremely useful in, in general topology, uh, in, uh, in analysis, in, in, in algebra, there are many areas in, in standard or regular mathematics in which Martin's axiom and other bounded forcing axioms have, have had applications and they, they have been used to solve longstanding problems there. So there's the fruitfulness uh, criterion that, that, is in, that is in play here. Um, and so it's a combination. I mean, uh, if... Uh, on one, on the one hand, you can reformulate those axioms as something that is intuitively appealing, this maxima, maximization principles. And on the other hand, you, you see that those axioms are very useful for, for many things in different areas of mathematics. So I think that they, this gives them uh, a lot of, of uh, uh, I, I don't know if, if you can conclude from this that they should be true, but certainly they are, they are, worth investigating and, and, uh, and worth developing their theory, see where, where this leads to. 
and then something similar happens with, with large cardinal axioms. I mean, large cardinal axioms, those axioms asserting the existence of inaccessible and other uh, incredibly large cardinals, they've, those axioms, um, if you look at the history of them, they, they have popped up in, in um, unexpected places in mathematics, not, not, only, not, not just in set theory. They have, they have appeared in, in other areas, standard areas, like in, in topology, for example, or in algebra. Uh, uh, people working on problems in those areas have come up with some, something that they needed in order to solve some problem. And it turned out that whatever they needed implied the existence of those very large cardinals. The most uh, famous example is, uh, is the discovery of measurable cardinals. Um, uh, Stanislav Ulam, um, who was um, um, famous for, for working on many different areas in, in mathematics and was also uh, participating in the Manhattan Project and many other things. Uh, uh, he he was um, he discovered that. Uh, okay, there. Uh, let me back up a bit. So there was this famous problem of of Lebesgue, uh, Henri Lebesgue, um, the the guy who defined the, the the Lebesgue measure, right? Which is the standard notion of mm-hmm. measure in analysis. So he asked um, because. Uh, it was known very early on that there are sets of uh, points in the continuum, in the real line, that cannot be measured. That there, there is no, there is no notion of measure for them. Uh, that that will tell you what is the measure of this set. The measure of an interval is very easy. You just look at the the length. But if you look at more complicated sets of points, then what is the measure? Well, there's this notion of Lebesgue measure developed by Lebesgue that tells you what is the measure of more complicated sets. Now, in 1905, um, uh, it was proved by Vitali that there are sets of points that cannot be measured. Okay, uh, He used the axiom of choice for that, and it's known that you need the axiom of choice to produce sets that cannot be measured. Okay, so then the, the measure problem, a very famous problem, was that, uh, well, can you expand the notion of measure of Lebesgue in such a way that you could measure all sets of reals, okay? So that's called the Lebesgue extension measure or the measure problem. Now, Stanislav Ulam, what he showed was that, um, uh, and then Soloway, so I should also create Soloway for that. But what they showed is that uh, an affirmative act, uh, an affirmative answer to this problem, namely that there exists an extension of the notion of Lebesgue measure that will measure all sets of reals, this um, implies the existence uh, of extremely large cardinals, the so-called measurable cardinals, right? So again, this is an extremely surprising surprising fact that um, a very natural problem about the continuum um, that if you want to, it, it is, uh, it, it, the answer is yes, that there, there can exist such an extension, but if you want to show that such an extension exists, you have to assume at least the consistency of the existence of those very large cardinals that we call measurable. So you see, there is a, there is a very strong connection between the structure of the continuum, right, and uh, the existence of those extremely large uh, transfinite numbers, and that that's that, that, that's a mystery, I think, and it's mm-hmm. something that is extremely um, extremely interesting and, and uh, worth uh, studying, and that's what what people in in um, in uh, some well, at least a good number of people in set theory do. They, we, we, including myself, we study those large cardinals. We study those forcing axioms, uh, all these additional axioms, and and try to understand uh, how they work, what consequences they have, how how can be used to solve problems not only in set theory but in other areas. And eventually, eventually. Um, uh, it may take a long time, but eventually, uh, when the dust settles, 
we will have a much better understanding of the set theoretic universe and maybe some of these axioms. Uh, I have no doubt that large cardinal axioms will be uh, seen as true and uh, universally accepted. Uh, I'm not so sure about forcing axioms, but they are certainly very appealing and very fruitful. So maybe in the, the future, uh, those, were in, those axioms will indeed be considered true axioms of set theory. And uh, well, in particular, the continuum problem will be settled and many other problems that mm -hmm. can be settled using those axioms. Oh, so yeah, that's, that's what I was going to ask next, but I think you've just answered it. It was more of a sociological question, but just what sorts of things you think it would take for the set theoretic community to uh, consider something like the continuum hypothesis or problem settled. But I think that you right. answered that. So the last couple of things that I wanted to ask you about set theory, uh, moving away from large cardinals and the continuum hypothesis are a bit broader, but I'm wondering how you personally conceive of alternate set theories. So set theory, ZF, ZF without choice or with the negation of choice or um, act, set theories like new foundations. Do you just right. think of them as interesting logical exercises that don't pick out well, the, or don't yeah. describe the universe of sets? Or... Yeah, okay. So, so the particular case of ZF, yes, this is a very interesting theory. Because, uh, as I said, the, the axiom of choice, uh, uh, even though it's, it's extremely useful and we use it all the time, and, and uh, I think it's a true axiom and it's the right axiom. However, it does have um, uh, some unintuitive or strange consequences, the famous Banach-Starsky paradox uh, showing that you can take the unit ball and partition it into five pieces and by uh, translations and rotations, uh, assemble two balls that are exactly of the same size, which is, I mean, if you explain this uh, to any non-mathematician, will say, what? This is obviously false. This is total mm -hmm. nonsense. Well, no, it's true. It's a theorem. You can do that. But the pieces, the the the, the key th the key here is that the pieces into which you cut the, the, the initial ball, those pieces are non-measurable. And and to produce those pieces, you, you need the axiom of choice. Okay. So uh, the axiom of choice, uh, this is one of the reasons why it has been a controversial axiom. Uh, we know it's consistent relative to ZF that was proved by Gödel, so there's no harm in using it. But some people consider it to be uh, maybe not true. So uh, it makes sense to study ZF without the axiom of choice. And there are nice models for that. Um, for example, there is a, there's another axiom called the axiom of determinacy, which uh, was introduced in the 1950s by Michelsky and Steinhaus. And uh, this axiom, what it says, uh, it's, um, there's a notion of game played on uh, natural numbers. And uh, there's the notion of strategy of winning those games. And there's the notion of a set of real numbers of being determined, namely you play this game um, and uh, if one of the players, ha uh, the, the, uh, the, it's a two player game and, and uh, um, the say player one wins the game if the, the, they, they, they take turns and, pro and play natural numbers and uh, it, this goes on for infinitely many steps. At the end, this infinite set of natural numbers corresponds to some real number and player one wins if uh, this real number belongs to the set and player two wins if it's not in the set. So now this axiom of determinacy, what it says is that um, if you play this game, for any set of real numbers, then one of the two players has a winning strategy. It's namely, has a strategy that uh, if the player follows it, then no matter what the other player does, uh, uh, she will win the game. Okay. 
Okay, that's mm -hmm. an axiom that it's maybe a bit odd, uh, an axiom formulated in terms of games, but it's it's actually very nice and it has nice applications and, and wonderful consequences, but it contradicts the axiom of choice. So, um, right. however, you, it's a, you, you can work in the theory ZF plus this axiom of determinacy, and this gives you a wonderful theory. That's a theory that, for example, this theory is true in the... Uh, smallest universe that contains all ordinal numbers and all the real numbers, assuming large cardinals exist. So if there are very large cardinals in the universe, then you go to this sub-universe that contains uh, almost everything of interest for the usual mathematicians. And in this sub-universe, the theory that works there, that holds there, uh, is... Uh, zermelo frankel plus the axiom of determinacy, not choice, the axiom of determinacy. So you see uh, the study of ZF or some extensions of ZF that are inconsistent with choice can be uh, extremely interesting, extremely useful. And certainly there are lots of people, well, maybe not lots, but there are many set theorists interested in this and working with those theories. Now Perfect. for yeah, other- Yeah, that's exactly what I was- Yeah. That's exactly um, what I was wondering is how you uh, reconcile your metaphysical picture with these mm -hmm. other theories. And that makes perfect sense that you just look at a sub-universe where this right, alternate right. theory... So, so yeah, the, 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 view, the view is that there is the set theoretic universe, the true universe of sets, which is a model which satisfies the ZFC axioms plus... Um, the existence of large cardinals and maybe some forcing axiom. And then there are those sub-universes that are very interesting, like, like uh, this universe I mentioned is called L of R. Um, that's the least universe that contains all the ordinal numbers uh, it's, uh, and, and all the reals, and it's a model of, of ZF plus the axiom of determinacy if there are large cardinals. Okay, so that's that's the view that that is mostly um, the standard view of most set theories nowadays. Now, the other theories you mentioned, like new foundations, well, I don't know. I mean, uh, we don't know if uh, we don't know yet if new foundations is consistent relative to set theory. And uh, the question is, okay, those theories uh, no doubt have have interest. Uh, um, but but the question is, what can you do with them? I mean, what can you prove? Uh, can you prove uh, theorems uh, about about you know standard mathematical objects, about the continuum, about uh, uh, topology and algebra, and so on and so forth? Is 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 it a good theory? Uh, is it useful? And the answer is not really. I mean, it's it's a theory that that has philosophical interest, certainly. But mathematically, um, almost no one works with it because it's not it's not useful. It's not not natural for for mathematical work. So, yeah. And uh, yeah, for for weaker theories like just Zermelo set theory, um, the problem when you when you weaken so much the theory is that uh, it becomes very weird. I mean, there are models of Zermelo that are very, very strange that, uh, you know, the, huh. they have set, set theoretic universes that satisfy Zermelo theory, yet uh, many weird things happen, you know. So, no, uh, th these are not natural. I mean, our theory, those are theories that have some interest uh, investigating what what actually how strong they are what consequences they have how do they relate to other theories and you know from a proof theoretic point of view they are interesting however um they are not very interesting for doing mathematical work uh, they are too weak and they they, they have uh, um as i said there are models uh, that are that look very strange uh, that, that so so they are not they are not really natural theories to work with. Hmm. Well, the last set theory related question I have for you is about the possibility of alternative foundations, because my understanding is that there are certain areas of math that 
resist or may re- may resist translation to set theory in the way that we described earlier, uh, taking arithmetic as an example. So category theory is one alternative uh, foundation. Then there's homotopy type theory, and there are some others. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts about these rivals to set theory and whether or not it really has or is under any sort of threat uh, as for being replaced by one of them? Yeah, I I wouldn't call them rival. I think, um, okay, so in the case of category theory, uh, you can, um, I mean, you, you, you certainly can translate category theory into set theory by using, maybe you need to use inaccessible cardinals because usually in category theory, you work with categories that are typically proper classes, right? But if you, you even in this case, you can you can do the translation and, and uh, represent this set theoretically. Uh, so there is no real uh, contradiction or, or you, you, can, you can take both. I mean, you can take um, category theory and, and use it um, within a set theoretic framework. I've done that. I've done some work with category theorists uh, using large cardinals and so on, and there's no problem. And indeed, uh, category theory is uh, extremely useful. It's, it's a framework that is very useful in certain areas of mathematics, like algebraic topology, homotopy, and so on. And it comes very natural to people who work in these areas. Yet it's uh, it's it's possible to do the translation. Um, this uh, this need not be easy. I mean, I'm not saying this is easy, but uh, in principle it can be done. And not only can be done, but uh, in in the particular cases in which you can do the translation, this this uh, turns out to be extremely fruitful. Um, with in my work with some colleagues. Uh, working in algebraic topology and, and category theory, we managed to use large cardinals to solve some problems in their areas. And the difficulty was precisely in translating between the two languages or the two frameworks, right? Uh, as for homotopy type theory, uh, I don't know enough about that. Uh, it's certainly, from what I know, it's... it's uh, it does. It can be regarded as a foundation for a particular area of, of homotopy and uh, more general algebraic topology and so on. But I wouldn't call it uh, an alternative foundation for mathematics. It's certainly not. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's something that that it's. Uh, I've heard a few talks about that, and I think it's it's very nice. They have very nice results. Uh, it's an elegant theory. Uh, it, it has the additional advantage that, um, that, or I would say maybe the main interest is that uh, they they give a lot of uh, importance to uh, um, the constructive aspects. So being uh, che- uh, proof checking and and making everything explicit and so on and so forth. So this is this is uh, quite interesting. But again, I mean. Uh, seeing this as an alternative foundation of mathematics, I think this is uh, certainly not. I mean, it's it's uh, something very limited and uh, to a, p- a very particular area. Yeah. So, so okay. I mean, that's... Uh, yeah, uh, that's that's um, that's all I. Uh, I want okay. To say about well, this. that's all terrific. I I actually had a couple of questions for you unrelated to set theory. Uh-huh. Uh, okay. that I was just curious about. And so one, I don't think, I, this is very unrelated from set theory. I uh-huh. I don't think I've ever encountered a last name that is structured the way yours is. So your last name is, uh, and you'll have to correct my pronunciation, but Bagaria E. Tigrao. Bagaria. Bagaria. Bagaria, you put the, the, the accent on the, on the I at the end. Bagaria. Okay, so Bagaria y Pigrao. Pigrao, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Pigrao. <laughs> and where does it come from? And is the I well, these are, in and? These are Catalan, these are Catalan last names. Um, not, not very common ones, but certainly they come there. They are Catalan from, from the Catalonia region. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, if you Google so are, Bagaria 
If you Google Bagaria, you will see that most of them are in India, which I, I don't know why. I mean, apparently, maybe just a simple coincidence. But uh, in, in, in the Catalan language, the word Bagaria means county. So it probably comes from that, even though the spelling is different. But yeah, I, I don't know the real origin of my last name, but it's certainly a Catalan last name. And is the I an and? So it's sort of like you might say Robinson, Smith, and Williams or something like that in English mm -hmm. names? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And okay, that's that's just interesting to me. And then the last thing is that in the introduction to my episode with Joel David Hampkins and Graham Priest on logical and mathematical pluralism, and we've talked about this. Mm -hmm. I've, I've apologized, but I not only mispronounced your name, but I referred to you as a Spaniard. And this was quite yeah. wrong here. In fact, not Spanish, you're Catalan. But being the ignorant American that I am, I didn't know <laughs> that there was a tense relationship, to say the least, between Catalonia and Spain. And I thought that just for my own edification and maybe my audiences, I ought to ask just what the nature of the dispute is and what's at stake in your activism for oh. Catalan independence. Wow. Uh, do we have two more hours? <laughs> <laughs> That's a long story. <laughs> That's a long story. So Catalonia, um, Catalonia was was uh, an independent country until 1714. It had its own constitutions. It had um, it has its own language. The Catalan people are a nation with their own language, their culture, their history, and so on and so forth. So um, it all went wrong in 1714 as a result of the succession war, the Spanish succession war. This was a, a European-wide war in which Catalonia sided uh, with the British and the Dutch. And, uh, and, and on the other side, it was the, the Castilians and the French, right? So at some point of the war, um, the British uh, betrayed the Catalans and made the deal with the French and the Spaniards. So the war ended with the uh, Pact of Utrecht, uh, but the war continued for one more year in Barcelona. The city was under siege and eventually the, the troops of, of um, the Castilians and the French uh, uh, broke in and killed many people and, and they they uh, dissolved uh, the Catalan uh, institutions and uh, the Catalan language was, uh, was persecuted and eventually forbidden and, and so on. So this was the end of it. So we are talking about, uh, you know, over 300 years of uh, uh, domination of uh, Castile over uh, Catalonia. Not only Catalonia, but the, the what we call the, the Catalan countries, which is Cat uh, Catalonia, a uh, bit of south, what is now southern France, and the Valencia region, uh, plus the Balearic Islands. So this this is the area where ca the Catalan language is spoken, and we we look at this as uh, the 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 motherland of the Catalan nation. So uh, our problem uh, has been that over the last 300 years, we have had all sorts of attempts by the, by the Spaniards, the, the, the Castilians really, because uh, that's what, um, what they are. Um, they, they've tried to, uh, not, not tried, but they have, they've actually uh, repressed um, uh, systematically um, our language, our traditions, uh, and so they have imposed their their uh, their rules, but miraculously, the Catalan language and the Catalan nation has survived. <laughs> and um, there was uh, there was uh, a big progress uh, in the early twentieth century towards uh, regaining independence, but then all this was uh, again uh, uh, destroyed by by Franco with the with the uprising in 1936 that led to the Spanish Civil War. And during 40 years, during Franco's rule, uh, again, the Catalan language was persecuted. Uh, when, I, when I was a kid, I never had any schooling in my mother tongue. Uh, Catalan was not, was not allowed in schools. 
anyway, so it's a it's a very um, uh, long story of repression of of uh, the Catalan people, and uh, in recent years, uh, the the independentist movement never actually never died, but it gained a lot of momentum, which led to a, a referendum in, two, in on October first, two thousand seventeen that uh, we asked many, many times the, the Spanish government to allow to have a referendum similar to the one they had in Scotland or in Quebec, but they always said no. The years uh, starting in 2010, uh, the independentist movement gained again a lot of momentum and eventually the, the, the independentist parties, three of them, two big ones, one small, they got together and then decided to organize a referendum for independence without the permission of the Spanish government. And they did. And it was a, a great success. It was very, very well organized. Um, uh, we had uh, over 3 million people uh, voted. Um, uh, but what happened is that the, the Spanish sent uh, thousands of police to uh, to try to avoid the voting and they they beat people up they they there were more than 1000 seriously injured people um many of them you know older people uh, it was terrible i mean you can see uh, hundreds of videos um on the internet showing how how the voting was repressed they seized some of the some of the ballots and um Anyway, but but the referendum took place and uh, the ballots that were not seized were counted and the uh, yes to independence won by a huge landslide. I mean, over 90% of the people voted for independence. And even if you some people say, well, but the participation was low. Well, it was not so low because uh, many of the ballots were seized. So those couldn't be counted. And also because uh, some people feared the repression. So they, they, they didn't actually go voting. But even if you extrapolate, even if uh, all the, say, what would you consider to be a reasonable participation, say 70%, something like this. Okay, even if all the people up to 70% had voted no, the yes would have still won by something like 60%. So it was clearly a yes for independence, clear yes. However, uh, okay, so the, the politicians had uh, said that if the referendum, uh, if the people voted yes for independence, they would declare independence. Our president at the time was um, 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 very, very... Uh, uh, adamant at, at, at saying that, you know, I will declare independence the, just a few days after if the vote is positive and so on. And and eventually he, he did, but then he backed up. And the reason mm -hmm. is because um, uh, the, our politicians didn't do what they were supposed to do. Uh, I mean, you know, declaring independence with a, a state like the Spanish state that with all this history of violence and, and repression, uh, they had to, uh, they had to prepare everything much better than they did. And they didn't do the, their, their, their work right. So when the time came, uh, the president just, just, uh, just went into exile and the vice president and some of the ministers of the Catalan government, um, were summoned to go to Madrid, and once there, they were put in jail. Uh, all the leaders of the, um, the grassroots movements for independence were also put in jail. Uh, they eventually there was a there was a trial, but the trial was a complete. Uh, I mean, um, uh, I mean, it, it was it was uh, total nonsense. I mean, it, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it was, I mean, the judiciary in Spain. Uh, is not an independent, uh, an independent institution. It's totally controlled by the by the political parties and by the monarchy. So anyway, uh, so many of the members of the Catalan government and the uh, and the leaders of the grassroots movements for independence they were put in jail, and some other members, including our president Carlos Puigdemont, they went into exile in Brussels, and they are still there. And so we are now in 
this situation of impasse. I mean, the, the people still want independence, the grassroots movements are still active and so on, but the repression is so strong now that there are more than 4,000 people in Catalonia now uh, indicted for participating in demonstrations, just for participating in demonstrations. Many are put in jail and many more will be, you know, given huge fines or, or uh, jailed and so on. So people are are, uh, are afraid, you know, and then uh, it's not clear how this will develop. But my, my personal impression is that um, the current uh, government and the current politicians in charge uh, will will be voted out by the people, and new younger generation will um, will revive the whole movement. And I, I'm I'm pretty sure we will eventually gain independence, but it may take longer than we we expected. I can very much see why you would not want to be uh, mischaracterized <laughs> as Spanish. And just one one question is the spanish government's desire to maintain control over the catalan territories uh, a desire to maintain land and a tax base and this sort of thing or are there other um, considerations well i mean there's one important reason why they they want catalonia uh, to keep being part of Spain, and that's econo economics. I mean, uh, Catalonia right. has the gr largest uh, tax imbalance in the world, the tax deficit in the world. So over 4% of the Catalan GDP is paid in taxes to Madrid that they are never reinvested in Catalonia. So we are talking about 20 billion euros a year at least of taxes paid by Catalans that are not that are not returned, okay, uh, which means that uh, you know it's it's a non viable situation. I mean, this has been going on for decades, and uh, you know you see you see the the Spanish uh, government making huge investments in other areas of the of Spain, uh, building huge uh, freeways and and infrastructure and everything, whereas in Catalonia, nothing is done, uh, even though we are paying for this. So, so this is this creates a lot of resentment and and uh, a sense of injustice that 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 uh, we all Catalans feel. Um, and um, so, so uh, that's one thing. But there is another thing, and that uh, for Spaniards, one has to realize that uh, uh, Spain. Uh, didn't go through the so-called transition to democracy uh, in a in a proper way. I mean, when Franco died, there was a dictatorship. It was uh, everything was run by the fascists in Madrid. Uh, then there was this uh, transition when Franco died uh, with a new uh, Franco died in 1975. Then in 1978, um, there was a new constitution um, uh, that was voted. Yes. Uh, um, uh, in in Spain and in uh, this constitution was the basis for uh, the new political system, uh, democratic political system, and so on. Okay, but this is only on the surface. In fact, what happened is that all the people who were in the Francoist uh, um, Congress or Parliament, all the people in the in the judicial in the judiciary in the supreme courts and the other courts um just stayed there there was no change so you see the system changed but not the people the people in charge remained the same and now we have their sons and grandsons or granddaughters uh still ruling the same the everything the the uh, now on uh Okay, so there are political parties. Yes, there are two main political parties, the socialists and the, the popular party, the, the right uh, wing party and so on. But those are the same people that were ruling the country in time of Franco. And for the Catalans, it really makes no difference who is ruling in Madrid because they all agree to go against Catalonia. They, they, really, they really would like the Catalan people to disappear. 
mind or to become Spaniards. But we are not Spaniards. We don't want to be Spaniards. We want to regain our lost constitutions. We have never been uh, willingly um, part of Spain, you know, and we, we were, uh, Catalonia was um, incorporated into the into Spain by war, by violence. So we have never been asked, are you happy in Spain? Do you want to be part of Spain? We have never been asked that. Um, um, it's clear from the referendum we had in 2017 that there's a large majority of people who don't want that, who want to Catalonia to be again independent and, and have uh, its own its own control of of uh, um, the, the, you know the, the have the power and and uh, just be an independent state as a well, mm. you know yeah so <laughs> sorry <laughs> it's uh, oh no uh, thanks <laughs> well juan this has been a wonderful introduction to set theory i particularly appreciated your perspective on the large cardinal and forcing axioms and thanks so much also for sharing the situation in catalonia which i really had no knowledge about beforehand so that was really fascinating to hear okay well thank you very much it's been a pleasure yeah uh, thank you for having me hold on geeselings before you go Please uh, like, subscribe, follow if you haven't already. Smash all those buttons. And also, if you haven't followed me on uh, Twitter at Robinson Earhart, or if you're not joining me every morning as I eat my pint of ice cream on Twitch at Robinson Earhart on Robinson Eats, please do so.